Oh God, we thank you for life. We thank you for strength. We thank you for health. We thank you, oh God. We thank you for your presence, oh God. Your presence that makes the difference. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. We thank you. We thank you for your goodness towards us, your people. Oh God, hallelujah. As the psalmist also declares, for surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we will continue to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We thank you, O oh God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness unto us, O oh God. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. Uh, we thank you for your faithfulness, your kindness, your loving kindness that is better than life. Our lips shall praise thee. Thus will we bless thee, O oh God. We just bless you tonight for this another time uh, that we have set aside to, to delve into your word. Thank you, O oh God, for the sacrifice of your people who have, who have come out, O oh God, to, to share in your word. We pray for your the spirit, we thank you for your man's servant that you have prepared to teach us the word. Lord Jesus, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will give him unction, unction to function, give him revelation, knowledge. Oh God, we thank you for the anointing that makes the difference. Oh God, we thank you when we leave from here. We'll be glad to say that it was good for us to be in your house. We thank you, oh God. Break bread with us tonight, we pray. Somebody say, Amen. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. Let's turn our Bibles to Psalms 119 from 1 through 16. Psalms 119, 1 through 16. Now we welcome the social media platform for joining us in our Bible studies, Word of Faith and Praise Ministries. Welcome you wherever you are watching. Maybe you are streaming at home, at work, at play, wherever you are. We pray that the Holy Spirit may touch you and you will be blessed tonight. Hallelujah. For those who are here, we welcome you in the presence of the Lord another time. It's been a while while we gathered in this fashion. We've been meeting on the prayer lines all this time. We're thankful for God's goodness towards us. We keep pressing along as we continue to worship God in the beauty of holiness. Psalms 119, are you there? Say amen. 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 We will read alternate verses as we go into the scripture tonight. Um, Psalms 119, 1, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 2, blessed are they that keep his testimonies. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Uh, why don't I continue to read and you follow? All right. Um, we're online. Oh, that my ways are directed to keep thy statutes, then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart, when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes, O oh, forsake me not utterly. Verse 8. Verse 9, a key scripture. Wherewith how shall a young man cleanse his way? The question is asked. And the answer comes by taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart. Another key scripture, that I might not sin against thee. Verse 12, blessed art thou, O Lord, or blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Verse 13, with my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. 
I will meditate in thy precepts, verse 15, and have respect unto thy ways. And the last verse that we'll read tonight, verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. We honor it by saying, Glory, Glory be to God, the Father, to the Son, to the, Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, forever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And again, we welcome you into the house of the Lord. It's a delight to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Someone say amen. Praise the Lord. It's been a while. Um, myself, we were away over the weekend. We get a chance to see your faces, your lovely faces again. Um, we thank God for those who have kept the charge and held up the ministry. Um, all the leaders in their respectful places, if you're hearing, and those that are here, amen. We thank God for you. Amen. We have a guest with us, without further ado. Um, he's a guest and a friend of the ministry. Um, we go way back before I was born. <laughs> Amen. So we have a seasoned man of God that's in the house uh, visiting from St. Croix, Virgin Islands. Um, um, he's no stranger to this house. As a matter of fact, he has the keys to this house. <laughs> Amen. Um, my late father, Bishop Sidney Edwards, were great friends over the years with um, his family and our family. We have grown together. And God has been faithful to him. He has been faithful to the task. Um, he's pastoring there in St. Croix First Assembly for U.S. Virgin Islands. And we're so delighted to have with him, with him, with us, he and his lovely wife. Give them a hand, amen. No other than Pastor Stephen Wilson. Amen, praise God. He, I, he comes with a lot of, um, I could go on and on of the achievements that he have in the ministry, but we'll hear, thus said the word, the Lord from him tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Just welcome Pastor Wes and his wife. Amen. Give him a hand. Amen. Praise God. Um, and all the leaders, um, Deacon Patrick. This is a Sophia praise and worship team and the and the, and the crew, the young people crew, the Thompsons, amen. And my lovely wife is here and all I could call on names because we're just a few. <laughs> um, Sister Evelyn and her son. Um, all in you know, respectful places. Amen. Without further ado, is about we time is of essence and we want to hear thus said the Lord. Let us stand on our feet as we welcome to the podium Pastor Seton Wilson as he comes to deliver the word tonight. Amen. Praise God. Are you glad to be in the presence of God tonight? Amen. It's so good to be in God's presence. In his presence, what is this? Are you sure that in his presence there is not sadness? No sadness in his presence. In his presence there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. And at his right hand there are pleasures, pleasures forevermore. So I want to share with you tonight something that gives you pleasure. Mm How -hmm. many of you like pleasure? So it's very important tonight. I know as Pastor Henry says, we are no stranger here. I've been a part of this ministry before it gave birth. From Pastor Edwards was pregnant with the ministry. <laughs> and he gave birth to it. And those of you who are online tonight, uh, welcome. So, as I teach, I like people to ask questions. There's a difference between preaching and teaching. Mm. So, at any point, you can stop me as I go along. You raise your hand, 
anything you want to clarify, anything you want to ask, um, that is in order. It's a rapport, and so I want you to be willing to, to ask. The focus tonight is on Psalm 119, verse 1 to 16. And we are focusing on the centrality of the Word of God. Letting the Word of God be central in our life. And the, the topic I want to share with you tonight from Psalm 119, 1 to 16 is this. Those who live by the word of God are blessed. Those who live by the word of God are blessed. And so, it is not a light thing to ignore the word of God. You ignore your very blessing and God wants us to be blessed. So I'm going to begin right now. Let me just pray a prayer for the word. Lord God, I thank you for the anointing of the word right now. Let it be riveted deeply in the hearts of your people. God, I give you thanks and praise and glory and honor for the effect of the word tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The Word of God is central in all that He does. The Word of God is central to all that He does. It is by the Word that the universe came into being. Genesis 1 and also Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. But it, that is not only the truth is a part of the truth. The Word of God is what keeps the universe in existence. And it is the Word of God that regulates the universe. You will notice that Jesus Christ, when he combated the devil, he used the Word of God on three specific occasions. And even the devil did begun to imitate it and misquoted it. If you look in Genesis chapter 3 with the temptation of Eve, before sin entered the world, the devil attacked the world. I want you to focus on that. When Jesus was attacked in the wilderness, he used the word to overcome the devil. He's called the second Adam. Or the last Adam. And the second man. When he was attacked in the Garden of Eden, the first thing that the devil brought into focus was the word. The devil said, working through the serpent, has God said? Ask the question, see, the devil is smart. He did not attack the word immediately. He asked the question, did God say? And then he proceeded to attack the word. And Eve surrendered to the, the delusion that the devil brought, making the word of God not credible. God does mean what he says. Anytime you don't believe the word, it is unbelief that takes over. Anytime you believe the word, it is faith that takes over. The Bible says, the word comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It says, you know, faith is, it is impossible to please God. So we know the word, it is impossible to please God. You must take the word seriously. The word of God is eternal. It's central in all it does. His word is so important that the incarnated Christ 
It's called the Word of God because He's truth. John 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them through thy truth, for thy word is truth. And so, John 14, 6 says, He's the way, the truth. So, if He's the truth, He's the word. So, the word is central. The word becomes the greatest thing that God has to use in the universe. The revelation of God is the word of God. God also says that he honors his word. Different translation, put it different way. King James says he honors his word above his name. Psalm 138 verse 2. But an even better translation is this. He magnifies his word according to his name. He magnifies his word according to his name. Because the word of God and the name of God work in harmony. Did you get that? The word of God and the name of God work in harmony. If you are going to defeat the devil, you must take the word seriously. Research has shown over the years that one of the things that people don't want to do is come to Bible study and prayer meeting. We love a church of a thousand and fifty turn to prayer meeting or Bible study. I went to a church in Lakeland, Florida some years ago, 1988. The church has over 3,000 members. And that service, we deal with the word, prayer meeting, we had less than 300. We don't look at 3,000 to 300. You know that people are not placing the importance on the word. Christians are very weak when they leave church. At home, at work, they do and act, they act like sinners because the word is not central in their lives day by day. So his word is called by various names in Psalm 190. Various names. It is referred to as the word it is referred to as precepts. It is referred to as law. It is referred to as testimonies. It is referred to as precepts. It is referred to as statutes. It is referred to as commandments. It is referred to as rules. And again, it is referred to as word. So when you look at Psalm 19, you're going to see the psalmists use different words. And one of the reasons for this is that psalms are poetic. When you write poetry, it is write, written in a more dynamic way than if you're just talking. It is a word written in parallelism. It, is, it, it uses different words for the same thing because poetry it is, is more joyful and acceptable, and it is more flexible than ordinary language. There is a rhythm in poetry. So the Bible in the Psalms is written by poetry. And so I want to propose to you tonight that since God's word is so important, we should respond correctly to it. As verse 1 to 16 tells us. And we're going to look at some facts that are recorded from verse 1 to verse 16 tonight. As I said, I want to look at more. The first we should live uprightly according to the word. 
uprightly means you must live correctly according to the word of God. And as we go along, we want to continue to read. Somebody read verse 1 to 3 for me quickly. We must live uprightly according to the word. I am just paraphrasing the facts that are there. So, blessed are they that keep his statue, his testimony rather, and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his way. Yes. So here is we, we find that we should live uprightly according to his word. That's what he said. We must get our life upright according to his word. He says, blessed are those whose ways, ways blameless. Blameless doesn't mean sinless. But no one is sinless. It means one that is consistently conforming to his word. That is important. And he used law here. Law refers to his word. The commands of God. Who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimony. As he move from law to testimony. Those who seek him with your whole heart. That is extremely important. Point two, we should seek God with our whole heart, our entire heart. That is verse two. You know, I can't forget this song when I was growing up. Where this writer, or this songwriter, was singing, give me a little piece of your heart, baby. How many of you want a little piece of your husband's heart? Let me see your hands. Well, I didn't hear that How many of you would just want a piece of your husband's heart, or a piece of your wife's heart? Not me. How many of you? How many of you would just tell your wife, give me a little piece of your heart, baby. Um, and the, the, the husband's, um, the wife said to the husband, give me a little piece of your heart, baby. How many of you will satisfy with a, a little piece of the heart of your spouse? Not me, sir. Anybody? Because if you, you only get a little piece, who <laughs> are the rest? <laughs> Pastor Andrew, you want a little piece of a uh, Pastor heart? But you want a little piece of Pastor Edward's heart? If you're going to get, up, get married and somebody tell you, oh, I am willing to surrender a little piece of my heart when you go and get married. <laughs> God does not want a little piece of our hearts. And we should not desire a little piece of God's heart. Because God doesn't give a good piece of his heart to anybody. God gives his entire heart. That's what the cross tells us. If God was just going to give us a good piece of heart, Christ wouldn't come and die on the cross. Right. To, to become flesh and die on the cross means he not only give you his whole heart, he give you his body, mind, and spirit. Everything. Everything, Everything was surrender at the cross. So that's why God says, anyone going to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. You must give your whole heart. This is a crisis in Christianity in the world today. We give God a little peace. And God says, you can't keep it. That's not acceptable. It's an insult to me. To take a little piece of your heart and give me. What are you doing the rest with the rest? Mm -hmm. If you say you keep it, that means you see yourself more important than God. Mm -hmm. But you never really keep the other part. The other part that you don't give God is the devil has it. Give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. The devil has what you don't give God. 
You see, the, the devil is tricky. He let us feel that when we are serving ourselves, uh, when we think we are serving ourselves, we are really serving ourselves. When we are not serving God, we are not serving ourselves, it just appears that way we are serving the devil ultimately. Yeah. For a selfish life is a life that is given to the devil. So the devil likes when you are selfish because your life belongs to him. Any comment you would like to make as we go along? I was, just, I was just thinking on a point you made earlier. Yes. And uh, do you have any you have the mic you could um, Yes. Yes. Where, where God says David. David was a man after Yes, yes, Bishop. I um, appreciate it. Yes, now, the point you made earlier on was to be upright in art doesn't necessarily mean that you're 100% there. But you're talking, I, I thought about the, the point where God made the point where David was a man after his own heart. And the reality is when we think about David and what David have done, we think that David was really a sinful man, but you're talking about the fact that he's constantly repent, repenting yes. before the Lord, and that's what the Lord wants for us. Yes. Yes. Not that we're going, to, we're going to be perfect, but every time that we actually end up sinning, we must always have a repentive heart before God. Yes. Uh, that's a good point. God is not expecting perfection. He's not expecting perfection. What God wants is a honest heart, not a perfect heart. He wants a honest heart. David is a classic example. You know, people are not committed to God many times. Are the, are the biggest critics of God's people. I was reading the other day and somebody was saying, how could God Regard David as a man after his own heart. What kind of God is that? After what David did, right? And look at all he did. One man 20 years ago could be about 30 years ago. That David was a terrorist. <laughs> so it's not just a modern terrorist that turns David was a terrorist because David would go about and kill the enemies. David only killed enemies who God has given over to death. I always remember that. No one can kill anyone until God gives them over to death for whatever reason. Some died like Stephen and Peter and Paul for the glory of God. Some are died because of judgment, because of the wickedness. David usually eliminated the wicked and wicked people under the law that was acceptable. In the New Testament is not acceptable. We must understand the different eras of God working. So David sought the Lord with all his heart. Mm. David has a heart that fully loves God. But David at the same time had weaknesses because he was a man. He did not have new birth like us. He was justified by God. But he did not have the new nature like we have because the new nature is a New Testament reality. It comes after the cross and the resurrection. So David loved the Lord with all his heart. But his weakness caused him to fall. And this is something I want to tell each of you. Don't begin to doubt your commitment to God because of faith. God has left us with weakness for our purpose. The weaknesses we have is not an accident. Every one of us has a weakness at least where God left with us to remind us that we need His grace. I was talking to a brother almost 30 years ago. He said to me, every man of God, a woman of God, 
is left with some weaknesses. Like Paul said, I asked God to take away the thorn from my flesh. Yes. God said, oh, my grace is sufficient. Because the thorn reminded Paul that he was not a superman. He was a man. He said to Corinthians, I don't want you to see me above what I am. I am a man. When you see weaknesses in your life, don't take your weaknesses to mean that you are not fully committed. If you know you are committed. Some people battle with loss. Some people battle with the desire to steal under pressure. Some people battle with homosexual desires as a Christian. Some battle with lesbian desires, bisexual desires, covetousness. But their heart is not with their feelings. That's the difference. Mm. They have these drive and these things killing them, so to speak. But they are not with it. But they can't, they try and not getting rid of it. All that God is saying, don't surrender to it. Don't surrender. What you need in those situations is my grace is sufficient. God is saying to you, well, I leave some weaknesses with you to drive you to your knees, mm. to make you humble. Friends, this can't be more important. And this is why Jesus says, let the wheat and the tears go together until they have office. Because a lot of those people with weaknesses look like tears. But God says, those are my committed people. I have left them with those weaknesses so that they can access my grace and don't become proud. You see, this is, this is why Christians need to understand the Bible and the working of God. God has left some people with sicknesses. Some naive Christians will say, no, listen, they don't believe God, they don't have no faith. Yes. That's why I'm sick. Some people have to live on pills. It is God who gives scientists the wisdom to make the pills. To men, for some of the weaknesses, and even the pill is the grace of God. Because he supplied the knowledge for it. Some people keep on taking pills, and some naive pe Christians who don't have thrown any pills. Not long after the same people die. And the so-called faith that those who pull up to throw away the pills have never healed them. The point is this, friends. Hold on to the word of God with your whole heart, even when your desires and requests for God are not being fulfilled the way you want them to be fulfilled. But God is saying, my grace is never lacking. Grace not only comes in the form of healing, it comes in the form of endurance, patience, person perseverance, faithfulness. The word of God, if you study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you'll see all different kinds and some people can't, can't blend them together. So they pick out some part, some part of the Bible and throw away some part because they, they see it as contradictory. No, God is the God of cohesion, God of balance. Mm. Number three, we should delight in keeping his, his word steadfastly, verses 4 and 5. Steadfast means you are consistent. Keep his word firmly, diligently. That's what steadfast means. Diligently, with patience with endurance, with perseverance. That's what God wants. The man who is serious with the word of God and he feels it, he repents. 
by David. David says, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. So my, my bo broken bones, figuratively speaking, if you have been feeling God and you are sorry for it, it means that you are genuine. When the hypocrite feel it, I'm sorry. You understand that? The hypocrite is sorry if they get caught. If they get caught. And they don't want the punishment, the consequences. The man and the woman who feel it driving, who are diligent to the word of God, they are sorry when nobody knows apart from God. Oh my God. If you sin and are covered, you don't feel away because nobody sees you. You lack reverence for God. Because the man who has reverence for God knows that God sees everything. Yes, sir. So the man who sins and in private and is not worried is because they're not concerned about God, they're concerned about people. They're, f they're concerned about people because, because nobody sees them, they're not worried. They're not dealing with God. They're dealing with people. Listen, friends, when you are concerned about what God thinks, you're not even concerned about what people think. Because David says, look at this word. I look at it one time. And I couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. But later on God showed me. David says, against thee only have I sinned. He killed Uriah indirectly. He committed adultery with Mashiba. But he declared, Against the only of my sin. Why? Because sin is only sin when it's against God's word. Sin is only sin when it's against God's word. I hurt you. It is true that I hurt you and I need to apologize. But it's not sin because I hurt you. It is sin because I violated the rules, the laws, the testimony, the precepts, the word of God. Let me show you, let me give you an illustration. When God said to King Saul, kill her, God was saying, hurt him. To kill him is ultimate hurt. If he had killed her, it wouldn't be sin, but he would have hurt him. When he failed to do that, God said to Samuel, you do it. Samuel sent his man for her and he put his head on the block and cut it off. Did he get hurt? It hurt him to death, but it wasn't sin. Because the sovereign God commanded it. Sin is sin because it violates the will of God. If what you do does not violate the will of God, it doesn't matter how many people got hurt. You have not sinned. This is what, you see, a lot of people you see writing and preaching and a lot of people commenting, and journalists and things like this, they don't have a clue about God and his mind and God's word. They don't understand sin. A thing is only sin if it violates the will of God. God's word, God's testimony, God's rule, God's commandment are reflections of his will. If you do something that does not violate the laws of God, it doesn't matter who gets hurt, you have not sinned. We have to learn that. Jesus pronounced condemnation on Judas, woe unto him. He condemned him eternally as a man. He was man in the flesh, but he had not sinned. Because he was flowing in the divine will of the Father. That's it. You read hundreds of thousands of books today with all kinds of theology. A lot of them is just human opinions. 
have nothing to do with truth. Thy word is truth, says Jesus. Number four, we should focus on the word steadfastly. To focus is what you keep your mind on. That's why Jesus would say to the, to the devil. The devil came to Jesus and says, turn this stone into bread. And I want you to know something. The first act of the devil to get you to disobey God's word is to appeal to your sense perception. Taste, smell, seeing, hearing, touching these things. These are sense perception. The devil seeks to enter your mind through your senses. There are five lobes, say psychologists and neurologists, to your brain. Five lobes, therefore, to your brain that are connected to your senses. And those where your senses send messages to your brain, it, 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 the, the, these senses, sense perceptions are sense waves are processed by your brain, the neurological system. And then it send that message, give you a command what to do. That's what happened to him, the God of him, her sense perception. The Bible says, when she saw it, it was good for food, it was the sense perception. Yes. From sense perception to the mind, it was good for wisdom. First, good for food and good for wisdom. She did not even know what wisdom was. Because she was learning it from the serpent. A beast that she should be going governing, but the beast was under control of Satan. So the beast was a robot. So the devil appealed to Jesus' sense perception. First thing, you're hungry. And since you have power, you're the sons of God. The word, if you're the son of God, in the Greek, is a logical question. Since you are, the word if is saying, since you are the Son of God, prove it. Yeah. Turn his stone into bread. Because after 40 days, Jesus was hungry. And the temptation was, contrary to the will of God, use your power to make bread and eat it. It would have damaged him as a human being. If you, after 40 years, 40 days, you are hungry, or even 20 days, and you go and eat hard food, it's going to damage you. It takes a miracle for it not to damage you. It's a biological fact. You start with drinks and light food and things. You don't start with bread. You don't start with bread. Well, Jesus said, it is written. Back to the word. It is written, man shall not live by bread at all, but by every word that proceeds out of the word of God. The word is greater than food. The word strengthened Jesus for the 40 days. For angels came and ministered to him, and the angel ministered the word to him. He says, go up to the temple. Jesus followed the devil up to the temple. But following the devil to the temple was a sin. God's word and wisdom are complex. Some people have said, no, if Jesus followed the devil from the wilderness to the temple, he was a big devil. No. Following the devil from the wilderness to the temple was not temptation. It was the spirit driving Jesus to follow the devil to the temple. That's why we have to know the word and can discern. How can he be following the devil to the temple? God's word. He was discerning God's word to follow the devil, the devil to the temple. The temptation was not following the devil to the temple. The temptation was not following the devil to the pinnacle of the temple. 
The temptation was to drop down. Have the command of the devil. And preachers wrote some time ago that there was no way to obey the devil and not to obey him. And they thought I was preaching everything. You see, that is what happened to small minds that cannot sense theology. Yeah. Following the devil to the temple from the wilderness was not the sin. The Holy Spirit was leading Jesus. It was not the devil leading Jesus. It was the, the Spirit leading Jesus to follow the devil to the temple mount. To the pinnacle. And when the temptation comes, the devil is a sin. Now listen. It is written. Devil quoting the word. Again, you must know how to interpret the word because the devil will twist the word, interpret it to defeat you, use the same word to defeat you. The devil shall jump down because it is written, I will give the angel a charge over you and he stopped. Uh, he stopped there. He quoted the word partially. He will give his angels charge over you. That was not the key point. Psalm 91 says, he, he will give his angels charge over thee to keep you in all his ways. To keep you in all his ways was left out. The devil quotes scripture out of context. Take out a piece of the word and leave the rest. And the piece that is taken out is detached from the context. God promised to keep you in all his ways. Not your ways. If you had jumped down, it would be Jesus' ways in the flesh, not the Father's way. Jesus says, quoting another word, the counter rock, the partial, distorted quotation. He says, it is also written, <laughs> thou shalt not take the Lord thy God. You seek scriptures to be balanced. If he had jumped down, he would have tested God to use power that God had no intention to you. So, this is why when you study the Bible, it doesn't matter which theologian, no matter what degree they have, no matter how they study the languages of the Bible, after they study the languages of the Bible, Greek, Hebrew, Amharic, they still know, have to know how to interpret it and apply it. And that's what many of them don't have. They have the academic part of the word. They know Greek, what it means in culture, but they don't know how to apply it in Christianity. The word of God must be steadfast. Number five, we should praise God and focus on He says focus on his word steadfastly. Focus on his word steadfastly means that you are concentrating on his word. Almost you're concentrating on his word. You know a lot of preachers in today's world don't concentrate on the word. It is an easy thing not to go on the internet and don't go on a sermon. And there are many books on the market that give you sermons outline and take. And some, they give you the full manuscript of the sermon like on YouTube. One person was preaching on Sunday morning from the pulpit and radio and TV. Somebody was watching and says, didn't I hear the sermon already? So he decided to Google the topic. The sermon came up on the internet and he could follow the preacher word the word. A number of pastors today and Bible teachers don't prepare nothing. They go to the internet. There are thousands of sermons. All they need to do is to read it. Not impress seriously. One pastor one day gave me an old line on the hand and said, this is a sermon they might preach it before me. <laughs> I laugh because 
I don't preach about like those. The fact is that when you prepare a message, it is for a people. God gives you it for a people. God use your own language. God is not a mechanical God. Pastor West, when you, you are going to preach a sermon, God is using your language, your experience, your emotion, your conviction. Yes, sir. I, as, I'm glad you say that. Um... Mike. Yeah. Yes. Somebody's operating the whole chapter that said something like that because the very same chapter you read from Psalms 119, I think verse 105, says that thy word have I hid in my heart. Verse 11. That I, verse 11, that I might not sin against you. What David was saying that, you know what happened? When I get up in the morning, I go before the Lord and I seek to find out exactly how I should conduct my life. Yes. So that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Yeah. Like for example, when I am supposed to preach, I want, I want, I want a word from God. I must spend some time in the presence of God. Not necessarily because I'm going to yeah. preach, but especially because I'm going to preach. I want a word from God for that, because God is going to give you a word for that people yeah. at that particular time. Exactly. And so that's why I would, I would love, Pastor, if I'm going to be preaching and I need, I need some time, I need some time to spend in the presence of God. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, sometimes there are some emergency. At last moment. Even then, God dropped in your spirit emergency words. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> emergency words. Yes. So it is very important to know that when we just go and take up people's message and preach them, the short change of people, short change of people. Yeah. When we lecture at Bible College, for example, I taught the uh, Bible School for 17 and a half years, two different ones, and the school decided on textbooks. At some time when I was dean, I I chose textbooks because you need to give students things to read, to study the doctrines of the assemblies of God, or doctrine of the church of God, or word of faith, or what have you. But when I go to study, I follow the outline of the thought of the doctrine. But what I say in class is my words. I just don't read the textbook. I follow the doctrine and explain what people mean by the heritage. I look at what the heretics mean by what they teach. And I translate those in my own words. For you to be effective, what you are saying must come out of your belly. It must come out of your mind. It must digest. Yeah, digest it. There are some pastors who have to work full time. They can't find the time to study where they should. And so the night, they are struggling. So just find a, a sermon on the internet and read the Bible in the morning. You know, God can do my marvelous thing. God can take the same thing and speak to people's heart and give them some things separate and apart from what, what is there. God, was, God can translate what somebody is trying to say to people through the Spirit. But for you to be an effective minister, effective Christians, you must be able to take God's word and digest it like a cow digesting the food they eat and then bring it back. Preaching is digesting the word of God. To digest it, you must focus, you must concentrate on it for it to touch you. Yes. When it touches you, it changes you. Our Christians today are not focusing on the, focusing on the Bible. We run and we have a quick devotion. We read a little passage. If you didn't make a day out, somebody, what did you read this morning? You don't remember. It was not truly focused on. You're just fulfilling an obligation. 
day and night, I focus on the word of God. Yes. Um, the, 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 the mic. Um, this is the um, the way that the world is going to with this AI because what it is, a preacher don't really have to be in front of standing up. Now, I was reading something, I think it was in England where they had it, AI, you know, just standing there in front of a screen and everybody's at church and giving a sermon and the preacher is nowhere to be found. Yes. So that's the age and the technology and, and the, where the world is leaning to right now. Yes. That's where, it's, that's where it's leading because it's like GPS. GPS direct to many times GPS lead you astray. Yes. I, have, I went to the pastor one time and he, he tried to find somewhere in Orlando. He put in the address. GPS passed the address and gone out of it. <laughs> <laughs> we have to call the person we tried to meet and he said, you're way out of bounds. We put in back, we put the thing and to come back and the GPS videos are straight malfunctioning. Listen to me. I, I have been emphasizing these things for some time. I don't know why. When I was 12 years old before I got saved, God dropped a word in my heart. Somebody was reading Romans 8, 29. I want us to get this word. Who we foreknow in predestined to be conformed. So a lot of people miss the last part. You talk about predestination. You talk about the oh God was predestinating you to heaven, to, to, to heaven or to hell. Or some, so that's what some people think. And, and they, they are focusing on the destiny and they miss the destiny. To be predestined, the goal of predestination is to become like Christ. The original purpose come, let us make man in our own image. So you are going to conform. Listen, friends. No God sent preacher can't use AI to preach for them. Those are counterfeits. Listen, the world is full of counterfeit preachers, counterfeit teachers, counterfeit Christians, and God says, let the wheat and the tear grow together to their bodies. For some good Christians look like tears. So God says, I don't trust you. To separate them. I, as a pastor, can't separate them. I can't tell you 100% who in my church is a Christian. I can tell you that some of the behavior of certain people don't look like a Christian. <laughs> but sometimes the behavior don't look like a Christian. But they are struggling like David. They have the heart of God, but struggling like David. And if God was to give me the permission to eliminate the wheat, I would kill some Christians. My God. I'm not qualified. Mm. So I leave it to God. God says that the day of our peace, I can separate them. Yeah. So it's not our job to separate them. But I tell you, modern technology is showing up some of the counterfeits mm. yeah. in the church. Yeah. But it's not our job to eliminate them. God says, I will do it at the end of the age. God said, discipline. If somebody's in church and doing things contrary to the Bible, even if they are genuine, you have to discipline them. Yeah. So we have to be careful with this counterfeit technology. But AI is somebody producing it. And that's what I wanted to know. When computer is programmed, somebody has to program it. So what it reproduces is what? The person who program it, the computer is reproducing. So somebody is behind AI. Mm -hmm. of course. AI is not operating by itself. It's somebody program it to function according to the person who program it. Mm -hmm. So when you think it is in here working, it is the person in the background who programmed the computer and all these things controlling you through technology. Yes. So you think it is AI controlling you. Mm. It's, no, it's not automatic, it's not artificial intelligence. It's intelligent people. 
who wants to control you. So AI is somebody. <laughs> it is somebody's Something behind somebody. instrument. Somebody is behind it. The person who made the chips and put it in computer, and those who are planting it in people's brain now, yeah. to control the brain, so you can't think for yourself. You are thinking for the person who programmed the chip. We always remember that. Technology can't run by itself. It is somebody programming. But God so respect people that he don't program them. He created them in his image so that they can act like him by chance through the power of God. God does not turn people into robots except ex ex exceptionally. He turned Balaam for a short while into a robot. Balaam came to curse Israel and God said, no, we can't curse him. God turned Balaam into a good prophet. When you look at the prophecies that Balaam declared, as some of the greatest prophecies about Israel in history, all that God did was to exert his sovereignty. He said, no, you can't touch my people. You are going to say what I want to say. And after him finished saying what he want to say, God, send him back. Leave him alone. He went back to his deception. And he turned around now. He couldn't curse his friend. So he get God to curse them. And he cursed themselves. He get them to marry and involve in sexual rituals of worship in his country. And God killed 20 and thousand of them. Balaam could not curse Israel, but he deceived them to come under the judgment of God. We must study people. Don't run into everything that people tell you. Don't, because you have someone get up in church and give a nice prophecy, you run follow him, all oh, this is a God sent prophet. God could just manipulate him for the day to let him say what he wants them to say, and then they go back to the devil. Listen, God is a God of wisdom. And this is why we as Christians, it's not just studying the word, but we must study the word by the guidance of the spirit. Anybody can make the word say what they want it to say. Different denominations reading the same text and drawing different conclusions. A lot of people doing a lot of things. The Jehovah's Witness come to you and interpret the Bible one way. One time they really come to my office trying to win me. And when, when the students who came and could win me, one of the teachers came with them to my office and I entertained them because they want to win me and I'm seeking to win them. <laughs> one day, I had, I had their Bible, their translation, New World Translation, sitting on my desk. And they said, Christ must not be worshipped, only God. And I took up the passage in Hebrew, which says, and when he brought his only begotten in the world, he, he said to his angel, worship him. And the translator of the New World Bible made a mistake and they didn't say They didn't see 20 years and I, I took up the Bible and I said to them, must God be worshipped? Must Christ be worshipped? They said, no, the Bible doesn't say Christ must worship. And I took up the whole Bible, one translation, and I read the passage. When he, they, they translated correctly. When he brought forth his Holy Spirit into the world, he said, to the angels, worship him. And I said to them, what that be? The teacher and the student got up and left my office. That was the last time I saw them. Because now the student was realizing that the very Bible and what they was taught, their translation was saying the opposite of what they taught. You have to learn to know the Bible of God, the word of God. 
Number five, we should praise God after we have learned his word. Verses 7 and 8. After we have learned his word, we must learn to praise him. To praise God is to big up God. It's not to make him big, but to recognize his bigness and confess it. You can't make God bigger nor smaller than he is. So when you praise God, you are only declaring who he is and what he is. That's what you are doing. When you say, God, I am, you are great, you are wonderful, you are magnificent. You are not saying nothing new. God no, knew who he is. He just want you to confess it. Praising God is confessing who he is. Yes. Through his word. And this is what God wants. Number six. We should keep our hearts pure by giving heed to his word. Nine and ten. How shall a young man, how shall the one, the psalmist was emphasizing on young people. Let me tell you something. When people get older, it's the hardest thing to change them. Change them when they are young. But they still can be saved, the whole people. Some people get saved 78 years old. God still changes them. But it's harder than a young person. How should a young man cleanse his way? Or a whole man, a whole woman, young woman, a child. But by giving heed to the word of God. What is the word of God? Jesus defines the word of God in St. John 6, 63, I believe. He says, the word that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Spirit. The written word is on people in the Bible. They are spirit codified in language. They are spirit and their life, life and spirit codified in words. So when you speak the word with feet, you are speaking life and you are speaking spirit. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says the word of God is living, life and death. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any twin soul. Dissecting a sundown. Both soul and spirit. You know what we need today? The spirit of God. The scapel of God. To dissect your soul and spirit. Soul speaks of your psyche. Your mind and your brain work together. But the mind is spiritual. The brain is physical. When we study the word of God and digest it in our hearts, our hearts begin to impact our brain. When the word control our brains, it controls the neurological system. And this is why the word of God is so important. For the word of God, when it is digested in your heart, it is controlling the sense perception which are functioning from your brain. The lobes in your brain. So when all the five lobes in your brain come under the control of the spirit, it control how you eat. It control how you think. It control how you smell. It control how you see. All of us walking on the street. And we see we see similar things. But our minds function differently, we always see. We are living in a world where people are dressing almost naked, especially women. When your mind is controlled by the spirit, your neurological system, your high see the naked women, and you don't lose. Because your sense perception is under the control of the world. Next one, see women. And they are looking, they are hoping it could just get them in bed. Or something similar. Because the lobe in their brains are not under the control of the spirit. The word, the spirit and the word works together. God works by his word. He created the universe by his word and he controls it by his word. The laws of nature is said, it's called a law and conclude that God can break the law of nature. How is, how is it that God can break what he creates? Makes no sense. 
God created the laws of nature. They are finite. God can alter finite things in the world to suit his purpose at a particular time. God said to the son, the true Joshua, son, stand still. It stands still for a day, the Bible says. Scientists say it can't help because it breaks the laws of nature. What the scientists imply that God can alter his own nature. His own laws. He can suspend his own laws. He doesn't have no power his own laws. All those are intellectual stupidity. That's what it is. We, verse 7, uh, number 7, we will not practice sin if we keep the word of God in our hearts. The answer to sin is to keep the word of God in our hearts. The psalmist says, Your word, thy word, have I hidden in my heart. It is similar to one computer, you program computer. You could program your computer to block out certain things from coming in. You can block somebody on your phone coming in, you don't want to come in. You program your phone to block certain calls from coming in. Listen, the word of God, when you hide it deep down in your subconscious, Sigmund Freud, who's called the father of the modern psychodynamics that deal with the brain, the subconscious, people have gone as far as, as recording music and cassette for years. When you're hearing the song and cassette, a lot of them, they have what they call backtracking something underneath it, subliminal re recording that your that your mind cannot you, you hear cannot hear is underneath what you're listening and your subconscious mind and your unconscious mind hearing it with your conscious ears not hearing it you Simon Freud push that and said although yes those things happen we can manipulate them. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Have you ever encountered ideas that thoughts you never study, but right away you know they're wrong? Mm -hmm. Somebody says something, you have never heard it before, you have never studied it, but in your heart you know it is wrong. What is happening? It is a subliminal word of God deep down in your spirit, reacting against what you're hearing in your ears. And whatever is coming to you through your senses, the subliminal anointing of the word, thy word have I hid in my heart. Amen. That's why Fred must think about the Bible, think about the word, memorize it, meditate upon it. For when the devil comes with a subtle, deceptive, lying, spirit and lying thoughts, Way down in your belly, way down in your spirit. The word of God rise up in your spirit to oppose the lying thoughts of the devil. You can't explain it. If you were to debate it with these people, they would debate you and make you shame. Mm. Yeah. But you don't have to debate with them. Let them stay here. They can go and debate with, with, with whoever they want to debate. But your spirit telling you that it is wrong, so you reject it. While you are saying this is right, your spirit is saying that's wrong. That's where we must be with discern lying spirits, lying words, lying thoughts. Thy word have I hid in my heart. And I might not say against you. But you know something? The word of God is calling Greek the sperma. First John 3 9. Keep it in mind. He that is born of God cannot practice sin because the seed of God abides in him. What is the seed? The word. The Greek word is sperma. The word God sperm word is a sperm. That's what produced life. That's what produced conception. Your faith is a seed. 
Your faith takes the place of a woman's seed, a woman's egg. So your faith is egg. And so when the word of God joins to the word, it joins to the spiritual head, and pregnancy takes place in your spirit. God gets you pregnant with love through the word, pregnant with faith, pregnant with hope, pregnant with peace, pregnant with joy, pregnant with perseverance, pregnant with patience, pregnant with self-control, pregnant with all these things. But it is really one pregnancy. The Bible talks about food. God makes you become pregnant with the food of the Spirit. All these things are just pigs of the food. The fruit is the nature of God. And all the elements, love, joy, peace, love, suffering, patience, kindness, these are just manifestations of the character of God. That's why we need to know the world. You know something when I'm in church? People were jumping up to praise and worship. Praise and worship is important. As soon as they come to the preaching of the word, a lot of them can't sleep. The devil doesn't care if you jump up to not give a worship if you don't have the word in your heart. Because when you go home, your husband gives you a problem, your children give you a problem, you go to work and you have a problem, or you jump up in church doing praise and worship, that will help you. You must jump up when you need to jump up, but you must know the word. When the jumping up in church is finished, it is the word of God that is settled deep down in your heart that is going to keep you. Not the jumping up in church. Amen. Many preachers run from one end of the pulpit to the other, preaching their own concept, their own ideas. Some just stand up and preach the word. The word of God is living and powerful. That's why Christians must come to Bible study. The devil don't want to hear. Because the more word you have in your heart, is the more problem you're going to give him. So he'll give you a million reasons why you can't study the word. The people who study the word more, praise more. For your pray out of the word, your pray out of truth. Listen, friends, the time has come to smart the devil. Arm yourself with the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse uh, 10 verse 3 to 5 says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of struggles and look where God to every thought every imagination imagination and thoughts are connected to words when you imagine it, words are attached to your imagination. Because you have to codify your imagination. You use the words that are in your, in your mind, consciously and subconsciously. It says, the word of God counteracts thoughts and imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Some people are full of academia and nothing more. Mm -hmm. But we need the spirit and the word to work together. Pulling down, he says, every stronghold. Every lying thought in your mind is a stronghold of the devil. Every thought put there by God is a stronghold. So we must not only replace the stronghold of the devil, we must establish the stronghold of God. By the word. You can't know too much of the word. Ephesians 6 10 to 18 says, Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the whole armor of God that he might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the wiles, deception, the delusions of the devil. 
God proceeded to Paul to give six elements of the word. The breastplate is the word. The breastplate that the, sorry, the belt of truth is the word. Truth is the word. Belt, the belt of truth is the word. The breastplate of righteousness is the word because God says sanctify them to thy truth. That word is truth. The breastplate of the breastplate of the, of, of the, the sword of the, uh, of the word, of the armor. The breastplate of the armor is the word of God in your heart. And cover your heart from the delusions of the devil. The shoes of the gospel is the word. The gospel word. The shield of faith is the word for fear comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God. The helmet of salvation is hope. What is hope? Fear to the promises of God. The word. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God spoken. The word of God there in the Greek is rhema, which means a spoken word. So you have the word as a concept, number one. Then as holiness, the breastplate of righteousness. Then as the shoes, you walk in, walk in the world. As the shield which protects you from every attack of the enemy. The helmet of salvation, the word of hope. And the sword of the spirit, the word spoken against the enemy. Whenever the enemy comes against you, you speak a relevant word. But so the armor of God is the word of God functioning in diversity. That's what it is. God wants us. God wants us, brethren, to take the word seriously. So we should know by it, we should speak his word. We should speak his word. You will sit there, speak his word. Number nine, we should delight in his word as one delights in riches. How many of you would be glad if somebody walk in here tonight, give you $10,000 each? You would be excited. How many of you would be sad to get $10,000? You would be sad yes. to get $10,000? Yes, I need more. I need more. <laughs> <laughs> but at least it will give you some fun. You will be on your way to get more. Yes. Um, we will be part of the more. People will be excited to get, if, a, if you hear that you're going to get a million dollar gigs tonight, I know everybody will be excited, yeah, including my sister West. <laughs> a million dollars each and more. more. You'll be able to buy a church building and get out of here. Each of you give a 10% tithe for it. You buy the church and give off you know, apart from the ten percent. You buy a church building so fast, oh, but like, yes. but like, Pastor Andrew will be jumping up very woman from back. You see, but the Bible says the word of God is more important yeah. than money, yeah. than riches. Number eleven, we should memorize His word because there comes a time you might not have in the Bible. To look for a word. You must be able to quote the word of God. You know that Paul wrote from prison a number of his, his epistles. He had to quote the scripture that he wrote in the letter. His quotation from the Old Testament is from memory. No Bible. When he, when he was going to die, he called Timothy, bring my manuscript. My writings, bring them and bring my court before I die. He, before he died, he was going to consult with the manuscripts, with the word of God, to strengthen him. <coughs> so I challenge you tonight. Let God's word be central in your life. Let it control you. Is there any question before I sit down? Any comments? Several comments. I mean, I'm pretty sure that there is comments here. I was Any comments? Anybody want to make? You I want have, to make comments? I, Take the mic and 
we hit the corner. Right, right. I have the mic right here. Um, you were telling us earlier on about the, the, the need to depend on the Holy Spirit. Yes. And uh, sometimes there are those of us who think we are Superman. Yes. We don't need to have the Holy Spirit to remind us. But this song here, as I have it here, it says, I need thee every hour, yes. most gracious Lord. Yes. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. How we really need the presence of God in our life. Yes. Consistently. Yes. The word of God. God who created the world has given his word to run it. And even those in high position, God says, I lift up and I put down. Every leader good and bad in the world must be raised up by God for a purpose. Some for judgment, some for blessing. If God raised up a wicked leader to lead a people, the people wicked. He doesn't raise up good leaders to lead wicked people. And he doesn't raise up wicked leaders to rule righteous people. And when you see certain people come to power, and people running around, we don't need this, no, no, need that. Change your life. Change your life, and God will give you leaders that match you. America is in trouble right now. None of the two is ideal. None of them. But God is going to give them one of them. What they need. They could run. People think that it's voting and how much money you put out and things like that. All the amount of money that goes out is also on the control of God. Who oh God allowed to get the most money is out of the government of God. All those things. If you want change in the world, line up with the world in your marriage, in your business, in your job, in your relationship. People you're keeping who believe in the word of God. Don't take people for your friends who don't live by the word of God and don't believe in the word of God. It's going to damage you. The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. You will not plan to do evil. The word of God, if it is in your heart, will show you that it's wrong. Don't do it. First lady was saying something. First lady was saying something. Yeah, first lady. Number eight. Number eight. We should speak the word of God. Number eight. We should speak the word of God. And we, I quote in the feature, it says the word of God is, is the soul of the spirit. The soul of the spirit, the rhema of God, the spoken word. So, the important thing, and let me, let, let me just have it. I'm glad that you touched it again and just add something I didn't say. The Word of God can sanctify you by meditating on it. It saturates you. But when you want to defeat evil outside of you, meditation of the Word can't do it. You have to speak it. When you speak the Word, it's like bullet, it's like bomb. In, in Romans 1 16 it says the word of God is the dynamis of God the gospel Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 it is a sword of the spirit Hebrews 4 11 it is a two-edged sword in one of the prophets is a hammer that breaks the rock in twain but all these operations of the word your mouth is a trigger that let it go forth. Having it in your heart can sanctify your heart, but you can't defeat the enemy and the things around you without speaking the word. Speak it. Get up and speak it. You know, I'm just learning recently, psychologists are confirming that it is healthy and good to speak to yourself. But the Bible said a long time. Psalm 42, the writer says, Why hard thou cast out of my soul? Why hard thou disquieted within me? He was talking to himself. Was he a madman? It was a view when I was growing up. People said, I talk to himself a madman. I used to talk to himself a lot. And now, somebody talked to himself and him 
I found it when I asked me, why are you talking to you? Right. I'm talking to myself. Well, at times, I just feel compared to those talk what is inside of me. Yeah. The word. And when you speak it, it is bullet you and let you out in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Speak the word. Sometimes you're under pressure, you just have to speak the word over yourself. Speak over the situation. Mm -hmm. Speak it to the devil. Tell him, just release the bullet on him. And the demons are wrong, you just release it. Not only when you go to church, people like to talk at church, outside of church. You know, they're not saying much. Say the word, speak it out. Your word is more powerful than the bullets in the gun at your side. Learn to use that weapon. Speak it to yourself. Psychologists are saying today it is very healthy to speak to yourself. You get to clarify things for yourself. What once they usually call madness, now it is sanity and necessary. <laughs> and what was number 10? Number 10? We should meditate on the word. To meditate on the word is saturates you. It's, it's like cold chewing cold. You are, you are saturating your inside with, with what you are attending to you. The word enters through your ears, like the food entered through the cold, through the mouth, go down in the stomach and you. But you see, after they digest it, they regurgitate it too, let it all back. It is very, very, very important. Any other one you want to remind now? Excuse me. Eh? Mike. Is it Mike? Um, you touch on something, and I, I know it's, it's very important because we, as we, as you said earlier, we this America is coming up for an election, and it is really serious. And so, um, as a church, and I, uh, a lot of people are, are looking for um, words of wisdom, and from the word, because it's in the Bible, um, that we are living in the last days, and it's going to be a deceiver that's going to come to deceive. But how, where do the church, and how would they go out to cast the vote? And where do the church stand? And my, my, my thought is that we need to pray for the will of God. But as you said, not none of the two, but we know that God can use, use even the, we don't even care to think about, but my thing is that I know the church is trying to stray away from it, but the people need to be educated. Yes, but whether they are educated or stupid, God's way will be done. And this is how it works. In, 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 in Babylon, God chose Nebuchadnezzar. Then he put on Nebuchadnezzar Belshazzar. Then he bring Darius and Cyrus and others. Vote or no vote. Who something God brought forth Government through coups. If you read history, mm -hmm. God brought people against Solomon, and Solomon was going up against God. He brought two opposition against him, and one of them had up leading ten of the tribes. Jeroboam was one of uh, from Solomon um, leaders. He ran away, away, but when the time came and Solomon departed from the sea, God brought him back. He led Israel till southern Israel and northern Israel, ten tribes. Put it this way, Christians must always believe God is in control. Whoever got there Amen. is who God wants here because of the situation at the time. And what his will is that God brought Cyrus and he said to Cyrus in Isaiah 45, he said 150 years before he raised up Cyrus, call him by name. And he says, listen, I'm going to give you the treasures of darkness. And nobody will be able to stand up against him. Cyrus was a wicked man. Yeah. But that's what the people needed. Nebuchadnezzar God put him in the field like animal for seven years and then brought him back. And then he confessed. No God apart from Jehovah. Mm -hmm. They wanted to kill Daniel, they couldn't kill him. God set him up. Mm -hmm. They wanted to kill Shadrach, Mishael, when God threw them in fire like a man who lit the fire died, they couldn't kill them. You and I can't die before God ready. You need to live it that way. You don't, you don't live carelessly. You live your life. You need to live, do the wise thing. But God is going to keep it. 
God is going to bring forth in America what he wants according to what the situation needs. And there are some, a lot of those who have the most money, you tell me the election, but where does money come from? God orchestrate that they want, they want to get, get the money that they can do what they need to do to get there. God is at every point. Every point. And a lot of church people are on the right and on the left. True. So it's not church. It's God. The church is not united at nothing in the world today. In politics and those things, no unity. Yeah. So the unity is with God. Yeah. He is going to overrule everything to bring forth his will. Amen. And it is the condition of the people that determine what God does. Yes. He sent good leaders for people. God says the center of the wicked shall not abide over the land of the to the righteous. Psalm 125. Read Psalm 125. So if the wicked take over a nation, they are not. They are not God's people. They are, they, they are not saying that God's people are not in the, in the country. But the country is not dominated by God's people. They are dominated by anti-God people. So God sent them anti-God leaders. And all the quarrel and in the press and all they are doing, not changing now. God is in control. It shall be well with the righteous. Isaiah 310. It shall be right. It shall be well with the righteous. Say to the wicked, it shall be disaster. God needs to shake America. Yeah. Another part of the world. And before Hitler came to power, scientists, it was said that, listen, the world doesn't need religion no more. Science is now in charge. Science produced the nuclear bombs. World War I, World War II, we have all airplanes that was invented to do good, was used to carry bombs to drop on people. <laughs> God is in control. I say it right. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Great words of wisdom that we need for the hour. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God is in control. Amen. Yes, Amen. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in our battles. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand on our feet as we're dismissed. We thank God again for um, using Pastor Stephen Wilson to bring forth such a sound word for, for us today so that we can continue to, to walk by faith. Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word, word of God. That word have I what? Hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We should just love the word. Amen. We should continue to develop an appetite for the word. So many times we stray away from it, but we just ask the Lord to direct us back to the word, direct our hearts back to the word. Amen. Because in it, we live in him, we move in him, we have our being. We cannot live without the Word. God his, himself is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we need the Word of the Lord to guide our heart, guide us, right? We thank God for it. We cannot do without um, the direction. The Word brings direction to our life, lamp unto our feet, you know? light unto our path. Amen. We thank God for such a great work. Clap your hands again. Amen. God. Amen. Praise God. We thank, we're thankful to the Lord that the Lord is in charge. He's in charge of the church. He's in charge of the world. The Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So we need not to worry, we need not to fret, we need not to fear, as long as we stay in God and stay in His Word. Um, I was about to say that it's the Lord who puts um, apostles, teachers, and pastors in the body to edify the church. And we thank God for 
the gift that God has given us tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you once again, oh God, for this time that we have the opportunity to come into your house and to hear your word. Thank God for, oh God, giving us this opportunity, this privilege to gather, how oh, important it is for us to gather together so that we can worship you in the spirit of holiness. We thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for directing our path today, O oh God. We thank you for keeping us and preserving us throughout the day and protecting us along the highways and the byways. We thank you for preserving your church. We thank you that you're coming back for your church. O oh God, prepared people and help us to be prepared and be ready. Uh, when you shall put in your appearance, when the trump of God shall sound, we'll be ready to hear that trump, that sound from heaven. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that you are the one that is in charge of the church. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church and you are in charge. You are the King of glory. We thank you that you sit high and you continue to look low on the affairs of men. Oh God, we thank you. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to our cries. And we thank you that we can trust in that kind of a God. Hallelujah. Who will never fail us. And so we just anchor ourselves deep in the word of God. We anchor. We set down our anchor deep. Again, Lord Jesus, we set our anchor down deep in your word. Hallelujah. We thank you. We thank you. Somebody praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your spirit that is with us. Hallelujah. We thank you for the spirit of God that dwells among us, and keeping us and preserving us. The spirit of the Lord is in the church today. We thank you. Father, we pray as we are about to leave this place, but not from your presence that you will continue to protect us, to preserve us, and to guide us as we go to our different places of abode. Those who are watching, we thank you, O oh God, that they will receive something from this word. We pray, O oh God, that even if they don't have a relationship with you, Lord Jesus, that the Spirit of God will convict their hearts and help them to turn to you something that was said. O oh God, will convict their hearts, O oh God, that they will turn from their sins, O oh God, and come, repent and come to you and know you as Lord and Savior before the door, the ark door is closed, O oh God, for this season, for the church age. We thank you. We bless you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Somebody say, Amen. 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 Praise God. Um, before you go, um, we just dismiss the social media platform. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward for our next um, time that we meet on Sunday, God's willing. Um, we'll um, convene in the same, same place, same time. And if you are out there and you want to be a blessing to the ministry, there are ways for you to do so on the platform. All right, God bless you and we love you with the love of the Lord. For those that are here, as we are dismissed,